Would you stand with me this morning? I want to get right into the Word of God. We're going to watch a video, just another video in just a moment. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 78. We are starting a, story, a, a, a series today called This Is My Story. We have, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting too old. I can't say church merch. I'm just, I sound too old. Or swag. I'm like, I'm like, I'm old. I want to say gear or something like that. I don't know. We got some new stuff out there. We got t-shirts and different things um, that you're welcome to purchase. But uh, we're excited. The next four weeks, we're going to be um, talking about different stories of what God has done in people's lives right here in our church. And then I'll be preaching following the videos. But um, we also, the videos are anywhere from about five or six minutes to about ten minutes long, and so the whole story can't be told in that amount of time. So we're actually launching, and it's already should be out right now, a podcast that'll be out today. If you if you listen to podcasts all the time, you can go to where those are at and just look up Landmark Church, Purcell OK. It should come up. If not, go to our website. There'll be a link, and you can go find the podcast. So every story, the person's also being interviewed, and it'll be a lot longer, like 30 to 45 minutes, so you can hear much more of the story. And so We want you to hear this all week, but we're excited about this for the next few weeks. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 1. Are you ready to hear the word of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. For I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them. The children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart right, and those whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, and we thank you that today as we come, Father, I believe you are changing us, that we want to leave here different than how we walked in these doors. And Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for the miracles we'll hear about. Thank you for the testimonies we're going to hear the next few weeks of how you are still working, still moving, still making a difference. So Father, we give you this time right now to listen to what your Spirit is speaking to us in the name of Jesus. And all God's people together said, Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus loves you and I'm trying and you may be seated. (laughs) Amen. Let's watch this video together. Hello, my name is Bobby Williams and this is my story. Approximately two and a half to three years ago, I was diagnosed with a osteosarcoma tumor. Didn't know much about it at that time. So I started going seeing specialist doctors, um, around two to three specialists. They all denied to even help me due to the reason it was really complicated. So they referred me down to MD Anderson in Houston where they do these type of surgeries daily pretty much. Um, Went down there the first time to get a biopsy and this and that. Um, Came back home and of course they called me and said that the biopsy didn't go through. So I had to go back down there to do another biopsy. And in that time, I kept getting worse and worse and worse with pain to where I couldn't do anything with my family. Couldn't hardly drive a mile without it hurting. So at that time, when they was gonna schedule the surgery, that's when COVID hit. So that delayed my surgery for about two years. And in that two years, I didn't know it at that time, but God was working on me and healing me. And I kept praying daily and, and nightly and my wife would pray and 
I know my church was praying and everybody was praying for me, but I felt like he wasn't healing me because I want to, to give him all the praise. And I was losing faith. And at that time, I just kept asking, please, you know, heal me, God. Let me give you all the praise so I can go around and tell people what you can do. And at that time, I didn't have a relationship with him. I didn't love him, but I knew why he came here on the cross. I knew all that, that he died there for all of us, uh, for our sins and everything. I was scared to have the surgery because I heard so many bad things from the other doctors here that I possibly may not walk again. I possibly couldn't have children again or anything like that. So that's another reason I put it off. Well, when I finally started to have the surgery, I went down there uh, on April the 20th or the 19th. My first surgery was April 26th, over 12 and a half hours. Then I also had another surgery this following day on the 27th of April was another over 12 and a half hours, a total over 25 hours of surgery. They removed this tumor, but before then, all I can remember is my wife being beside me, telling me she loves me. I was going back for the surgery, and all of a sudden, I seen a bright light. And when the bright light appeared, I saw three angels: one on my right, one on my left, and one above my head. They was the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And I said, he doesn't want me yet. And at that time, the lights went away. Then it was seconds later, the light came again. And of course, I saw the angels again in the same spots, one on the left, one on the right, one above me. And I said, he doesn't want me yet. Then the, it went away. Then the third time I saw the light, I knew right then I was probably going home, you know. And I said, what do you not understand? Jesus doesn't want me yet. But in my mind, I thought I was going home at that time. So I started telling everybody that I love them thought that was going to be the last time last time I seen people in in flesh and I said well Jesus I said I hurt right here on my left and I hurt here and within seconds I felt a very warm sensation and at that time all the pain just disappeared then I woke up and I was laying in a hospital bed with no pain. The doctors stated that I'm a miracle. They said there was only two ways that this happened. I said, no, there's only one way this happened. Jesus healed me because I felt him do it. And the other way that he doctor stated, well, he said, there's a reason why you put this off for two years the surgery that your nerves rerouted to your left leg. I shouldn't be operating my left leg at all. I shouldn't be using my left foot. I started off in a wheelchair. Then I worked my way to two crutches. I worked my way to one crutch and now I'm on a cane and I'm walking. It's a miracle what he can do. I want to stress out there to people that was, they're out there, they're kind of like me, how I was. I, I checked off the box. I went to church. I checked off the box. I prayed. I checked off the box. I prayed for people. Thought I did my good deeds, but I didn't have a relationship with him or was in love with him until then. And now I know what he can do. And I, like I said, I want to stress to people, you need to find God in your heart 
you need to have a relationship with him. You need to be in love with him because like me, you walk by faith, not by sight. I think I said that right. <laughs> uh, but he will heal you in his time. He did that with me and I can't thank Landmark Church enough for all the prayers, all of my Landmark family. When y'all prayed, I could feel it. And to this day, I can't thank y'all enough for everything that y'all have done and reached out to me and my family. It means the world to me, but I only have one person to really thank, and that's Jesus for healing me. Because I started losing faith, you know. Then I said, well, if you're not gonna heal me, then put it in the, put it in the doctor's hands and let them heal me. So they did their part. Then Jesus stepped down and did his part, just like he said he would but it took over two years for him to do it. So don't lose faith. Don't ever lose faith in him. Find, find him in your heart and love him. It's so amazing what I felt, what I experienced, and I can't thank y'all enough. Come on, give Jesus some praise. Amen. Amen. Bobby, we're proud, man, of all that God has done, and I'll say more about that in my sermon, but thank you, man, for, for sharing that. One of my favorite subjects growing up was history. It was one of the few things I was decent at in school. I could remember dates, I could remember things, and history was something that I could remember. And what we're talking about the next few weeks is history in this sense that it's his story, that God is writing his story. And that he is writing our story. And that God is weaving that and understanding what history is. And I believe it's the story he's been saying from the beginning. From the beginning of time, God has been a miraculous working God. He's been a God that did miracles. You think about the Old Testament, we sang about it earlier. He split the sea so they could walk right through it. The, the, the Red Sea's parts and they go through it. They're, they're on the other side and they're thirsty. And he makes water come out of a rock. Manna is picked up. And, and all of a sudden, all these miracles begin to happen. But it doesn't stop there. They get into the promised land. What happens? They're, they're, they're going around the promise, going around Jericho, and the walls fall down. Joshua prays a prayer, and the sun stands still. Throughout the Old Testament, we see miracle after miracle after miracle that God is doing. Maybe it's just the Old Testament, but then Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, and he turns water to wine, and he's doing all these miracles. He's healing the blinded eyes, and the lame are leaping, the dumb are speaking, and all these things begin to happen. And maybe it's just Jesus, but then the Bible says in the book of Acts that, that people are resurrected and things happen. And then it says unusual miracles were done by the hands of Paul because the Holy Spirit was upon him. So we see throughout the church history miracles. And then maybe it was just then, but then we see 2,000 years later, God is still a miraculous miracle working God that he has not stopped, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because he did miracles then, he can still do miracles now. Amen? Do you believe that this morning? So why does God do miracles? Two quick things this morning. I'm not going to speak very long, but two quick things. I believe that God does them, number one, because he loves us, because he's good, because he wants to work in our life, and he wants to do something in us that we experience. There's nothing wrong with information. I believe information is important. I am not the kind of person that's against education. I don't believe when you get saved, you check your brain at the door, and you act like you're just dumb the rest of your life. I believe in education. I believe that that is important. But here's the problem. There's so many times we get so educated. We have so much human wisdom that I believe we educate ourselves out of what God wants to do in our life. And if we're not careful, we begin to put so much thought into things that we don't see what God is doing. And I believe God wants us to experience him. I believe God wants us to experience him for ourselves. I believe God wants us to have an experience. Because you know what? People can try to rob you of wisdom. And they 
they can rob you of knowledge, but they can't rob you of an experience. They can't take away what has happened to you. In Job chapter 42, Job said, I'd heard about you, God. I'd heard about them talk about you. This is Job, a righteous man. It's interesting. He, he's a good man. And I thought about Bobby, what Bobby said earlier. Bobby said he checked off all the stuff. You can say, I did all the right things. Job, I mean, here's a righteous man. The Bible calls him that. But Job said, I had just heard of you. I have heard of you. What Bobby was saying is, I had heard about the author of the book. But when Bobby had an experience and he got to know the author for himself, all of a sudden things changed. And in Job 42, Job said, I had heard of you, but now I have seen you with my eyes. Now I know who you really are. Now I have seen who you really are. And when you have that experience where you just don't know about God, but you know who he really is, there is nothing, no devil in hell, there is no circumstance that can rob you from experience the life-changing power of God and knowing for yourself that he has saved you and sanctified you, excuse me, and changed you. Amen? Amen. Give him a hand clap while I get some water. Amen. Help me. But I believe there's also a second reason he does miracles, and it's what... Joe, what, what the psalmist says, this is Asaph that's writing this psalm, and he says this in Psalm 78, he says, come close, I want to whisper something to you, I want to tell you something. In other words, he, he's saying like a grandparent, pull up a chair, let's gather around the porch, and let me tell you some things. When I was a kid, um, I grew up in Mississippi, and we would go every summer, and every Christmas, we would come to Oklahoma for vacation. Some of you get to go to extravagant places for vacation, I got Oklahoma. We come back to see our relatives. We go to Denver at Christmas, but we always went through Oklahoma. And so we would stop in Stratford, Oklahoma, and we would go to my, back then my great-grandmother was alive. My great-grandmother was this short lady, kind of plump, had white cotton, beautiful long hair. I loved to give her hugs and just feel of her hair. It was like white, it was white, white cotton. She would comb that thing out every night. And my grandma was just a beautiful, her name was Virginia Hinkle. And I love great-grandma, I love Grandma Hinkle is what we called her. And Grandma Hinkle would get me and my cousins, we were about the same age, and she'd say, boys, come up here. And my grandmother lived down the road, this dirt road, lived down the road a ways, and we'd go up to Great Grandma's house, and we would sit there, and she would play games with us. She would get one of us to get down on all fours like a horse, and she would get somebody to ride on their back, and she'd, you know, she's sitting in her chair, just relaxing, watching. She goes, now, boys, take them in a circle. Now, this is my 80-something-year-old godly, fearing grandma. She Take them in a circle. And then after a while, she would say, shake them till they spit. And you literally were supposed to, the one on the bottom was to do this, try to knock the other one off. And my great-grandma, I'll never forget that. Shake them till they spit. She'd always say that. And then she would say, now, I want you all to sit down. And she'd have us sitting there, and she'd begin to tell us stories. And when I mean stories, I mean supernatural things. I, she would tell us stories about a time that she saw a lantern floating through the sky and all kinds of weird things. And then she'd say, okay, boys, go on down to your grandma's house. Now listen, we're six, seven, eight years old. It's dark by now, and we're on a gravel road. And going down to grandma's house, and so we're walking down there, and I mean, we're just slowly walking, and all of a sudden, something's rustling in the pond over here. It's over here. The little, the little, it's not a very big one. They have like some tall um, grass right there, and something's kind of moving, and we take off running as fast as we can, trying to get to grandma's house before something gets us. You know what? I can't even remember half of the stories I try to preach. I don't remember them afterwards. But all these years later, probably 35 years later, I can tell you every single story that Grandma Hinkle told me, and I can tell you it in detail. Because what she was doing, it is called oral tradition. She is teaching about what she has gone through and passing that down from one generation to the next. She's saying, this is what I experienced. But she wasn't just telling us that we would have information. She wasn't just telling us so that we could say, well, I've got more information. I've got another story to tell. She would, she would do that because she was reminding us. There's another one I've told you before. I don't have time to go into it. Where she literally believed an angel had come and stayed in their house. And, and she she would always say, boys, I want you to remember what Hebrew says. Be careful who you entertain because by, be, by, by talking to some people, you have entertained angels unaware. She always quoted the King James, and I thought she said underwears as a kid, and I was very confused. What do I want to do with angels' underwears? But anyway, 
But I, I've never forgot that scripture. I joke about it, but I've never forgot it. Because Grandma Hinkle was passing down from one generation to the next, this is what God has done and this is what God can do for you. And what the psalmist says in Psalm 78 is, come up, let me tell you a story because I'm doing something here. I am telling you about what God has done. This is what God did. And then he begins to say this, I am establishing a testimony. I have established a testimony in Jacob. The word testimony there literally means a witness. In other words, what the writer is saying is that if, when you go on a stand and the judge says, I want you to talk about this car crash that you saw, tell me, and you stand up there and you say, you know what, somebody told me one time that the cars used to not crumple like they did now and they used to be built better. You know what the judge would say? I don't care what you heard a long time ago. What did you see happen right now? Because you're sitting there not to talk about what you heard but to witness to what you saw and experienced yourself. And here's what God does. God sets up a testimony in Jacob. Why? So that we are reminded that he did things before. And we need to know that. I want to know what he did. I want to know how he healed people. I want to know about the revivals that he did. But he didn't just do it then so we could talk about it now. He did it then so we could experience now. So you know what? I want to tell my boys about what God has done for me. Not so they can walk around telling everybody. But so that they can long to experience that for themselves themselves, so it awakens something inside of them that says, God, you did it for my grandma, you did it for my grandpa, you did it for mommy and daddy, now God, do it for me, God, do it in my generation, God, visit my generation, God, do your reviving right now, the Habakkuk says, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in other words, God, don't just talk about it, don't just tell us about it, but God, do it right now, and I believe what God does is revive things in our lives. He works in us. He gives us a testimony, not so that we can just talk about it, but so that others can experience it. And I believe what Bobby was teaching us today is this, that God did a miracle. And you know what? Because of that, we can expect God to do a miracle in our life as well. He is no respecter of persons. And because he did it for him, he can do it for us. We can believe it. We can trust it. We can put our faith in it and know that God is at work. Amen? Amen. The second thing is this. I love this part of the story. And it's simply realizing that not everything happens in the moment and the time we want it to. That many times when we don't get the results we want, we think God's not at work. And even in the Bible, I referenced this last week, and I think I said it in a prayer down here in the second service, so you, if you were here, you heard me. But the Bible says Jesus is praying for one man, and he prays for him to be healed, and he says, what do you see now? And the guy said, I see men as trees. In other words, I, I see better than I did, but I can't see everything I need to see. And Jesus prays for him again, and he's healed. And I believe that, that many times the healing of God, I believe God can do things right now. I believe God can divinely heal people right now. I believe God can heal people of emotional things right now. But I also believe that God is at work. And if it is a progressive thing, it is still the healing power of God. It doesn't lessen who God is and what God is doing. And here's Bobby realizing that he had to wait two years. But you know what? During that time, God is working behind the scenes, rerouting nerves, doing things that nobody could see. But but God is at work in his life and doing things. And just because you don't always see it doesn't mean God is not at work. Just because you don't see everything doesn't mean God's not working. You have to step out in faith and trust that God is at work in your story. He's at work in your situation. That God is still moving mountains. He is still doing the impossible. He is still healing. And just because we don't see it right now doesn't mean he cannot do it. But God is at work and we have to trust him through the process that, God, you're still doing it. It may be a progressive thing, but I will not quit. I will not give up. I will not give in. I'm going to keep on going and keep on being faithful through all of this because I know you've done it before, and I know you can do it again. I know you've healed me before. I know you can heal me again. You saved me. You delivered me before. You can do it again. God, you are the God that still works, and because of that, I am trusting you through this that you you can work miracles. Amen? Amen? And in your life, God has done things. The reason, and we'll talk about this more in the next few weeks, 
But the reason you need to share your story, and today on Grandparents Day, I think it's important. Because I can tell you I'm where I'm at right now because of the shoulders that I've stood on. I can't take credit for what God's done in my life to myself because I know how God helped me. I know the people that God put in my life. I'm standing on the shoulders of my parents. I'm standing on the shoulders of people that I know. I'm a pastor today. My dad's been pastoring 48 years, and I've been able to stand on his shoulders and move because of that, because of great praying grandparents and parents, because of people that poured into me. And today, you are here, not by yourself. Many of us had graying grand, praying grand, we had graying grandparents too, but you had praying grandparents. Grandparents, you had praying grandparents that prayed over your life, that prayed over things long before you ever came into existence, that prayed over you and prayed over your situation. And today, God made his life alive and he made his life alive in your life. But guess what? When he did that, I believe it was because of prayer that was sent out into eternity long before you were ever spoken to existence, long before you ever came into being. I believe it was a prayer that was prayed for you that I believe made the difference. Difference. And so when we begin to realize we have to pass it on to the next generation. I'm almost done. Here's my fear. I like, you know, I like technology. It's fine for when it, when it works good. And now we have things like TikTok and I don't even know. I, I don't have that. Some kind of, it sounds like a clock to me. I don't know. Anyway, TikTok, Instagram, and we record these things. But you know what? Parents, grandparents, the best thing you can do is not record something that your kids can watch when you're dead and gone. The best thing you can do is look them in the eyes and tell them about the goodness and the power of God. You testify to God's goodness. You testify to what God has done. You pass that down to the next generation. And then you tell them, and what God did for me, he will do for you. And you let that rise up inside of those children and grandkids. I don't care how old they are. You let that rise up inside of them to where they began to desire to experience God for themselves. That is what we want. We we want a testimony established, but so the next generation can experience it for themselves. Amen. Will the worship team join me? I'm almost done. Today, some of you walked in here needing a miracle. Today, some of you walked in here needing God to move. And today, you walked in here knowing, God, I need you, I need you to do something on my behalf. And the good news is this. God wants to meet you today. And he wants to change your situation. He wants to heal you. Not only physically, I believe it. We pray for people in the first service, and I believe in divine healing. But God wants to heal your emotions. He wants to heal your heart. He wants to heal you inside. Today, he wants to change you and transform you. But you've got to walk by faith and not by sight, as Bobby said. You've got to trust him. That even when you can't see it, he's still at work. And I believe today, as God begins to work, here's the thing. Some of you are going to walk out of here and say, I don't feel any different than when I walked in here. And the enemy is going to want to lie to you and tell you nothing happened. But we used to sing a song when I was growing up, you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Blind, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame, for the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. And we won't leave here like we came in Jesus' name. I believe as you walk out those doors, you might not feel anything in the natural. But supernaturally, God is changing things. Supernaturally, God is working. Supernaturally, God is moving in ways you can't see. But you've got to give it to Him. You've got to take the first step. And the first step is give it to Him. The first step is say, okay, Lord, you, you are the writer of my story. I give it to you and let him work. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Would the prayer teams join me down here, please?